sorry, Eric, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, again, thank you everybody for joining us for the annual meeting of the Norwich Historical Society uh, for 2022. Uh, we're ready for the next slide. And again, uh, this is being recorded. Um, so please, um, it does look like everybody is muted, but uh, uh, just a reminder that uh, we do ask everybody to mute themselves uh, if they're not presenting. Hang on, Eric, let me just fix this real quick. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Can you see that, Eric? Yes. Okay, great. This should work now. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. In the spirit of truth and equity, it is with gratitude and humility that we pay tribute to the Mohegan tri tribe, the original stewards of the land where the city of Norwich now stands. Norwich can trace its origins to the year 1659, when Chief Uncas gave a gift of nine miles square of his native homeland to the immigrant people surrounding him. The Norwich Historical Society recognizes the town's debt to that landmark event of centuries ago and acknowledges the encroachments which resulted in the eventual dispossession of the tribe's land. The descendants of Uncas continue to live and work beside us in the present and will be among us in the generations that follow. We now work toward greater awareness of the inequities of history most especially the destruction of the tribe's burying grounds, which resulted in the establishment of a, more, of a memorial grove dedicated in 2008. As we move forward to the future, let us not forget the past so that we may build an inclusive and equitable location for all those who come to occupy what was once solely native land. Is it stuck again? Oh, you're on mute. Technical difficulties, everybody. Just one moment. Sorry, I apologize. I'm going to just do something really quick. Hang on. And fix this for good. Let me do it this way. And oops. Okay. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Formed in 2001, the Norwich Historical Society seeks to preserve, protect, and promote the rich history of Norwich, Connecticut. We are a registered 501c3 nonprofit organization. Hang on. I'm, I'm going to have to just do it this way, Eric. I don't know okay. why I'm having so many trouble. I think my screen is getting overloaded by hosting everything, so. I gotcha. I don't understand why. Okay, hang on, let me do it this way. Okay, can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, our current board of directors, uh, myself, Eric Beat, president, William Champagne, past president, Tammy Flynn, Maria Gray, Jane McCallick, vice president, David Oat, Joseph Smith, Sandra Susi, secretary, Jessica Supley, treasurer, and Darrell Wilson. Our staff, of course, is Regan Miner, executive director.
And at this time, we'd like to stop and say a special thank you to our past president, Bill Champagne. Now, Bill, we wish to thank you for your years of dedicated service to the Norwich Historical Society. Under Bill's steady leadership, the Norwich Historical Society has grown from an organization that primarily held events to, uh, to one which has grown to do more tangible things. And by that, I mean, Bill had the vision to apply for grants and, and pursue a uh, very talented and capable Regan Miner uh, to be our executive director. And Bill and Regan were able to build upon the grant writing process to embark upon projects such as historic building uh, uh, renovations, uh, self-guided walking trails, uh, meaningful programming, and the continued planning of Norwich Town as an historic tourism destination. So thank you, Bill, for building this organization up to what it is today and for your continued dedication as you uh, continue to work on these projects. Eric, thank you so much. And the board has been great to work with and Regan has been spectacular to work with. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for bringing me on board. So um, up for, um, for a renewal this year, the proposed slate of 2022 board members uh, would be myself, uh, Jane McCallick, and Sandra Soucy. Um, is it appropriate? Well, what's the most appropriate way to, uh, to come up with a motion? Uh, I guess I shouldn't be the one coming up with a motion if my name is on the list. Uh, Darrell Wilson, I'll make the motion to um, endorse uh, Eric B and the entire slate for uh, election. Thank you, Darrell. Do we have a I'll second? I'll second that. Second. Thank you, Bill. All those in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. Uh, any, uh, any abstentions? Any against? Any against? So moved. And also we want to, uh, to thank uh, Jessica Supley, um, who has been our treasurer for her hard work and her dedicated service. Um, she has opted not to uh, renew her term, but um, she has, uh, has put in a lot of hard work and has done a phenomenal job as, uh, as treasurer. So thank you again, Jess. So just, uh, just some quick numbers. Um, the 2020-2021 uh, uh, revenue of the organization, um, our annual appeal took in uh, $6,974.48. Our business contributions were $2,205.25. Our donations were $9,000. $361.66. Our membership dues were $1,117.99. Our events were $3,164.55. Private, state, and federal grants, uh, $98,043.80. That does sound like a lot of money coming in, uh, but all of the money that comes in in federal grants goes right back out again as soon as we pay all of the all of the vendors and contractors and whatnot. Uh, merchandising, $539.21. And uh, other programming, $9,214.03 for a total income of $130,620.93. And uh, now I will turn it over to uh, our executive director, Regan Miner. Thank you, Eric, I appreciate it. And I apologize for my tech issues. I promised I tried this before the meeting and I seem to keep having trouble. So I really apologize for that, but at least everyone can still see the screen. That's all that matters. <laughs> so I'm gonna just give a brief snapshot of our accomplishments this past year. 2021 continues to be challenging, um, yet despite the continuous difficulties the pandemic brought, we were able to accomplish many of our goals. Um, for starters, we continued our partnership with the Society of the Founders of Norwich to rehabilitate the 1763 David Greenleaf House. We, we completed a conditions assessment on the 1750 Diane Manning House. 
and we installed an HVAC system at the 1789 East District Schoolhouse. We finished our historic Norwich Heritage Tourism Plan and we installed wayfinding signs for the Walk Norwich Trails. We partnered with Public Works to repair monuments in the Yantic Cemetery. And I wanna thank Davo, our board member for that effort because that was something he helped organize. So big shout out to Dave for that. NHS hosted numerous programs this past year, such as the Samuel Huntington Reef Lang Ceremony in partnership with the Norwich Area Veterans Council, Walktober, and the Ancient Ghosts of Norwich Tour. Additionally, in collaboration with the Connecticut League of History Organizations, NHS offered a virtual winter lecture series based on topics from the Walk Norwich Trails hosted between January and April 2021. The lectures are all available for viewing on our website. NHS partnered with East Lyme Middle and High School to provide field trips for students on the Norwich Town Green and the Colonial Burying Ground. Further, NHS created a lesson plan and a short video on the life of James L. Smith for Norwich eighth grade students. And we'll hear more about James L. Smith this evening, which I'm very excited about. Lastly, we opened the Norwich Heritage and Regional Visitor Center after being closed due to the pandemic. And further, we installed a new Western red cedar shingle roof on the building this past fall. Looking ahead to this year and to the years in the future, we are working on strategic planning and ensuring that the Norwich Historical Society is a diverse, equitable, and inclusive organization. We're continuing our ongoing work at the 1763 David Greenleaf House. We're beginning capital improvement projects on the 1750 Dye Manning House. We're planning to create videos on the Freedom Trail and Norwich Millionaire's Triangle Trail. And we're hosting a summer internship program at the Norwich Heritage and Regional Visitor Center for area students. And we're opening the Visitor Center in tandem with the Joseph Carpenter Silversmith Shop located directly next door. None of this would be possible without our numerous sponsors. So I'd like to take a moment just to express our appreciation for all of these organizations who have supported us over this past year. And if you wanna contact us at all, um, this is the way you can get in touch with us, either calling us on the phone, um, emailing us, or checking out our two websites, norwichhistoricalsociety.org and walknorwich.org, which hosts our Walk Norwich Trails. And that concludes the business portion of the annual meeting. And so I will end my slideshow here and we'll get started with the next program. Does anyone have any questions for me before we switch gears briefly? Hearing none, I'm gonna stop my sharing. Thank you very much, Regan, for putting all this together. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And um, I'd like to just mention too that as we go into our next portion of the program, um, when we uh, are ready for questions, if you guys would just be willing to post your questions in the chat and we will queue them up for the speaker at the end of the program. So that'll be our time for question and answering at the end. So just pop your questions in the chat as we go forward here. So it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our featured speaker and our presentation, James L. Smith, Norwich and the Underground Railroad in Connecticut, the ties that bind. This presentation focuses on the perilous journey of James L. Smith from enslavement to freedom in the North. His journey ties into the national and state freedom struggle that served to transform the lives of people, both in the South and in the North. The saving grace for many fugitives was the ties that bind. So our featured speaker this evening is Dr. Stacy Close, a native of Georgia, Stacy Close has worked in higher education for more than 25 years. A professor of African American history, Close received his PhD and his master's from the Ohio State University and his bachelor's degree from Albany State College at HBCU in Georgia. He has made paper presentations at conferences such as the Southern Conference on African American Studies, the Association for the Study of Afro American Life and History, and professional and organizational development network. He is published with journals and presses such as the Journal of Negro History, Connecticut Explored, Wesleyan University Press, Garland Publishing, Humanities, and Guilford Press. 
He has numerous honors, including the Connecticut State NAACP 100 Most Influential, Eastern Connecticut State University's Faculty Teaching Award, and being an American Council on Education Fellow. He has worked in higher education administration departments at the chair level, director level, and senior administration. He's also served as a panelist and guest on shows such as the Smithsonian Channel's Blacks in the Space Race, The Green Book, and NPR's Where We Live Disrupted and Disrupted. He is currently completing work entitled Black Hartford Freedom Struggle, 1915 to 1970. So welcome, Dr. Close, and take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, th thank you so much, Regan. And also uh, thank you to the um, Norwich Historical Society and Board for the invitation and to all of you for uh, being here this evening. Um, I, I have to say uh, before I begin my presentation that Norwich has a special place for me because my uh, first group of students I met when I came and taught in Connecticut uh, were from Norwich. Uh, there were three wonderful young people from Norwich. Uh, who embraced me and um, and made me feel really well welcome uh, in terms of Connecticut, in terms of conversations uh, about what Norwich was like and what it was like to be a student at NFA. And that will always remain uh, very important uh, to me. Uh, so what I want to do uh, this evening is to um, share with you uh, a little bit from the um, the the the, the uh, topic tonight on uh, James L. Smith. Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, the Underground Railroad in general, and also um, about Smith and how his, his, his movement towards uh, freedom ties into a, um, a, a, the larger movement for freedom. So in terms of James L. Smith and the writing of slave narratives, I, I first came across the name of James L. Smith uh, during my days in graduate school at The Ohio State University. Uh, there were some uh, 101 slave narratives that were introduced to me uh, by a professor uh, at Ohio State. I didn't read every, every last one of them, um, but Smith's was one of those that I had a chance uh, to read. And so what I want to do tonight is to talk briefly about his life and how it ties in to the overall freedom struggle and how it ties into the Underground Railroad. Because uh, there were a number of ties that existed between the life of Smith, uh, the life of the uh, Reverend James Pennington, and also to that of, of William Grimes. So I begin first with just a brief uh, conversation with you about Dr. Lorenzo Green and Dr. Carter Woodson. Many of you um, know of Dr. Woodson and know of Dr. Green. Uh, both were preeminent historians in the writing of African American history. But Lorenzo Green, I like to introduce to audiences, uh, some who may not know who he is, because he is the professor who brought for us uh, a history of Blacks in colonial New England. Uh, from 1620 to, to 1770. And what I love uh, about him is that he actually brings to the forefront a history from someone who grew up in Connecticut, in, in Ansonia. Um, he's born in 1899. But it was Carter Woodson uh, who brought us the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History and the Journal of Negro History. And what he wanted for us to do is exactly what the Norwich Historical Society is doing. He wanted us to produce and carry on the history of African Americans in some capacity, uh, not just in the writing of the history, but also of telling of the place and the story of African Americans in that larger history that exists in our states and our local communities. But it's also a story if you're talking about the enslavement of people of African ancestry when it comes to Connecticut. I describe it this way to my students and to audiences I speak to. I describe it in some cases that when, if you look at the Connecticut River or any of the rivers from the early, earliest periods in Connecticut, uh, they can be perceived of as uh, rivers of no return or the River Jordan. And that's what really happens 
to people who came in the period before James L. Smith uh, and to those who came after Smith and others who were part of this network of the Underground Railroad. They would experience that River of Jordan experience, where while others, it would be a river of no return. And so I begin with the concept of the river of no return. The Connecticut River runs about 70 miles through the state and passes through state parks, through Hartford, Enfield, and Middletown. But it also um, passes through an area that was once known simply as the, the Dutch Fort area. And in 1639, the Dutch, who dominated the area along the Connecticut River before the English, uh, they will bring to the Dutch Fort uh, a, a man by the name of Louis Verbies. And he was the first person of African ancestry uh, to be brought to the Dutch Fort. And within a year of his time at the Dutch Fort, Verbies' owner will murder him. All evidence of what happened in terms of why it happened doesn't really seem to exist. So the very instance of Louis Burbis' existence was in essence a river of no return. And though his life would end, there would be some similar incidents that would occur after that as well uh, for others in terms of this notion of the river of no return. Now, when I talk to, particularly when I talk to my students about uh, the question of the African-American presence in colonial uh, Connecticut, I, I often take them back to Venture Smith, and I do so in part because of what Carter Woodson and John Hope Franklin and what Lorenzo Green would say. They said, if you're gonna talk about the African-American presence, always ensure that there is a tie to the world of Africa. And one of the best ties to the world of Africa in terms of Connecticut history is that in the life of Venture Smith in Southeastern Connecticut, uh, because you get a chance uh, to not only hear about his travails of coming from the African world, but what it was like as a youngster aboard a slave ship. And then you begin to, to, to learn about how he, 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 he goes from slavery uh, to freedom. And he ends the 77th year of his life uh, as a free person, a free person who was a business owner and a free person who raised and reared a family uh, in Southeastern Connecticut. Now, the notion of the river return is also tied to the very development of Wethersfield, because there was Wethersfield Harbor in Connecticut um, uh, before 1698. And you could find that with molasses and rum and enslaved people uh, being sold and traded along the Connecticut River, as were white indentured servants. You could find by 1647, in this same time period, there was salted beef that was carried from Connecticut to Barbados, a major, major uh, slave island in the Caribbean. And businesses thrived along the river and the harbor because the large vessels found a place where they could dock and they could exchange all of these goods. And enslaved people were part of those goods, regardless of their, their skin color. And that river was a river of no return for them. Uh, then in terms of the Hartford Current, the Hartford Current reports in December of 1768 that though the river was frozen over, there was a vessel with cargo reportedly headed for the Caribbean. And in that same current article, uh, it talks about Thomas Mayhew of Hartford, who had for sale a very likely Negro fella about 18 or 19 years of age, and also a, a, a woman about 24 years of age, and a girl about five years old which they would actually trade uh, for pro produce rather than funds or money or any other thing. Now, what you find as far as Connecticut is concerned, many people know that after the period of the War for Independence, that Connecticut and many New England states began this gradual emancipation process, a gradual emancipation process that would see um, people still being enslaved in the teens and the 20s and some in the 1830s. But for those who were free after the war for independence, the freedom was very limited. And I wanted to share uh, some, some, some points uh, uh, on that. Uh, for example, 
in 1814, uh, William Lanson and Bias Stanley, um, African Americans in New Haven, they would protest and argue for no taxation without representation. They owned property, but they could not vote simply because of their skin color. In 1818, Connecticut's constitution restricted suffrage to adult white men who were 21 years old and owned property worth at least $7. Both Lanson and Bias owned property well above that limit. Between 1838 and 1850, African Americans in Connecticut offered to the state legislature some 20, to the state legislature some 26 sets of papers arguing for the franchise over a 12 year period. They would not get that right to vote until black men in the South got that same right to vote. Limited freedom. But limited freedom did not mean that the struggle fighting for freedom would end very easily. You find that well-known individuals like Sojourner Truth and Maria Stewart at one point in time made their home in Connecticut. Sojourner Truth would travel down to New York and work among the soil doves and then make her way back towards Massachusetts and then live for a short period in time in Enfield, Connecticut, where she was a part of life in Connecticut, arguing not just for women's rights, but also for the end of slavery. And in West Hartford, Maria Stewart was one of the legendary of speakers on the circuit advocating for an end to slavery and also for the rights of women, particularly the rights of black women. Now, when I talk about the ties at mine, the slave narratives of William Grimes, the slave narratives of James L. Smith and James Pennington, um, for a number of years in terms of American history, they were not revered or thought of very well. And I, I take you back to the, um, the early, early writing of 1918 and that of U.B. Phillips. The historian U.B. Phillips wrote a book called American Negro Slavery. And in it, he describes slavery as a benevolent institution, uh, a benevolent institution that was not harmful to black men, women, and children. When it came to slave narratives, uh, he didn't want to make use of slave narratives. Uh, he made the argument that slave narratives were biased and could not be trusted as valuable sources. Well, William Grimes produces a slave narrative that gives insight into what it's like to be a runaway and escape through the Underground Railroad. For Grimes, uh, he is born in slavery in 1784, and he will suffer at the hands of not one, but 10 slave owners in Virginia and Georgia. He will escape slavery in 1815 with the aid of black Yankee sailors who allowed him to hide behind bales of cotton on a ship bound for the North. And he would reside for a time in New York and later move on to New Haven. Among the people he met in New Haven were William and Abel Lansom. And he worked at the Lansom livery. William and Abel Lansom were two well-known black businessmen who resided in New Haven. Uh, he would later on move to the barber trade in New Haven and Litchfield, and he would have clients in both Yale as well as the Litchfield Law School. And he wrote his narrative of his life and published it in 1825. But he would also have to purchase his, his freedom a year earlier in 1824. Now, Grimes' life is directly tied to free black communities in both New York and New Haven. That is a constant for those who escape and run away. While they make their escape from the South uh, through a network that is very much uh, a, a singular network where they do a lot of the work themselves, once they cross the Mason-Dixon line, uh, they can then meld into communities where they are accorded some freedom, just like in, in New Haven. Now, religious freedom for black communities in Connecticut, while it came at the behest of building African societies and religious institutions, it also came with intense struggle 
and it also came with having to combat physical violence. Now, one of the things that will tie the freedom struggle in New Haven to the freedom struggle in Hartford and to the freedom struggle in Canterbury is that in all three cases, you find that people who are quite zealous in their effort to be free, they will find resistance in Connecticut. In the New Iberia section of New Haven, mob violence ensues in 1831. Now, on the, uh, the left is the statue of William Lanson. Lanson was a builder and an engineer who helped to extend the wharf there at uh, Long Wharf in New Haven. And he also built a section of the farming canal uh, with a work crew of about 25 black men who cut stones um, and then brought the stones in to extend the wharf. But he also owned the same livery where William Grimes, who was a runaway, got a job. In 1831, a, a white mob will move into New Iberia and they will begin to drag out all whites who are in the area because they deem them to be engaged in, um, in horrible and sullied behavior. And as a result of that, they blame much of the, the, the problems in the community on William Lanson. Now, what happens in 1831 is also there's an effort to try to build a black college in New Haven, a black college that many people think, at least in terms of the anti-slavery movement, is going to be possible in New Haven but it will not be possible in 1831. And you can look at the date uh, that, and it will help you to, to understand why. There were a number of newspapers who reported that no such college could be built in New Haven because you might get the same results as you got in Southampton County, Virginia with the re rebellion of Nat Turner. You might have the same kind of rebellion that might possibly occur in New Haven. And you also might have some issues of dating um, cross races in terms of 1831 New Haven. And so you have mob violence in New Haven in 1831. You will also have mob violence in 1834 and 1835 in Hartford as well, both against the Metropolitan AME Zion. Um, it's what it was then, it was just the AME Zion Church. And also what is also against Faith Church, the um, black congregational church in town. What happens in 1834 is that mostly young Irishmen uh, will begin to throw rocks and break windows in both churches, one in 1834 and one in 1835. But in 1835, there's an attempt to burn down the um, AME Zion Church. That attempt won't come to fruition. But what happens is Though the black parishioners who are leaving church are attacked, they will, not to their shock and surprise, they will actually engage and fight back against the small white mobs that are attacking them in both cases. But those kinds of struggles in terms of religious freedom to very exist at a as a church are there in Hartford. There's also that struggle that exists uh, in New Haven. Now, amongst the people who saw what happened in 1834 is Deacon James Mars. He was a deacon at the Congregational Church for Blacks in Hartford when it was attacked in 1834. Uh, he was born in Norfolk, and so he understood what was going on. It's also Deacon James Mars uh, when a slave owner from Georgia brought a woman by the name of Nancy to Hartford. Uh, he was one of the people who signed a petition that she should not remain in slavery in Connecticut. He, along with other church members and also leading white abolitionists, signed the petition. He signed the petition and for his signature, he received death threats and threats of his house uh, being pulled down. Now, 
Given what goes on in these communities, many of you know of the story of Prudence Crandall in Canterbury. Her decision to establish her school and then to establish a school that will welcome young black women. It's tied to the black community in Norwich, but it's also tied to the work of William Lloyd Garrison's. Garrison's Liberator also ties Norwich to Hartford. It ties Norwich to Hartford as well as New Haven, because inside the free black community, they are the agents of the Liberator and they make up most of the readership of the Liberator. And these ties allow for rapid communication uh, given, given the time period of communication. But it was Prudence Crandall who will welcome young black women into her school. Clearly, uh, it will anger town folks and many people throughout Connecticut. But for Sarah Harris, for the niece of William Lanson in New Haven, here is an opportunity for greater education. And here's an opportunity to establish the right for education wherever you might be. And so Norwich is intimately tied to this struggle that is part of the Underground Railroad and the people of, of Norwich have been so for a number of years. Now, in terms of Hartford, in 1827, James Pennington will escape from Maryland. James Pennington, like William Grimes and like James L. Smith before him, they will all be tied because they are very young men. They are also tied because they have some skill as an artisan, as did the leg legendary Frederick Douglass. They are also tied to the world of David Ruggles. Now, for Pennington, his escape from slavery in 1827 comes with an interesting twist, and I'll try to be uh, quick with this. When, when he escapes from slavery and he makes his run near the border of Pennsylvania, he is actually captured. And slave catchers will decide to let him go. They decide to let him go because he says to them three words that they cannot resist. He says to them, I have smallpox. And they decide to let him go. And he will wind his way to New York, then to Connecticut. And then eventually he is approached in 1838, after studying to be a minister, uh, he will be approached to be the pastor of the Congregational Church in Hartford, the same Congregational Church that had been mobbed in 1834. But he accepts the pastorship in 1840. And there he begins to build not only up the Congregational Church, but he also begins a school. He begins a school for black children because black children are not so welcomed inside the, uh, the, the, the public school for, for white children in the city. So he builds a school inside his church. And there's another school for black children inside the AME Zion church. But like most pastors and most members of the black community in the North, they understand and know about anti-slavery societies. Pennington knows and is a member of the Connecticut Anti-Slavery Society. He's a member of the World Anti-Slavery Society as well, and a delegate. But he also understands the importance of writing. He understands the, the importance of writing what's going on in your community. He wrote for the Colored American. He supported the literary efforts of Black women like Anne Plato. And then he wrote a textbook of the origins and history of people of African ancestry in the country. He wrote his own narrative, The Fugitive Blacksmith, and then he published a newspaper. All of these things are important in terms of the freedom struggle. And he was also tied to the Liberator as an agent of William Lloyd Garrison's newspaper. So the ties that bind 
in Connecticut were very strong. You have a small, vibrant, and very relenting community uh, over this issue of combating uh, and fighting against the institution of slavery. Now, to James L. Smith. Now, James L. Smith's autobiography was published after uh, he was uh, freed from slavery, as were most autobiographies. But James L. Smith's life is one in which his escape from slavery uh, is also in part tied to the state of Virginia. And it would be an accident as a youngster that would limit his mobility, but also give him an opportunity to be an artisan. He will write in his autobiography that he is preoccupied with the ideas of freedom and liberty. And if you go through these huge numbers of slave narratives that exist, there's a strong preoccupation with liberty and freedom. And particularly in the, the upper South states, uh, people are preoccupied with liberty and freedom. There is no way that James L. Smith in the 1830s did not know of Nat Turner. There is no way that James L. Smith did not know of Venture Smith. There is no way that he did not know of, of Gabriel Prosser. These were things that were, were carried through this vast network of sailors. Sailors tended to share information. Now, in terms of his escape though, in 1838, he and his two friends used a canoe and a large vessel to sail the Chesapeake into Maryland. And once in Maryland, they traveled to Newcastle, Delaware, and they would purchase, purchase tickets on to Philadelphia. And his two friends would split for him from there and then on. But once in Philadelphia, his freedom like that for Pennington and that for Grimes it, it is dependent heavily on the free black community. It is a place where you can go and you can immerse yourself within a community and you can hide and be less visible. And it was from a, a man by the name of Simpson that he got the opportunity to wind his way to New York where he met David Ruggles. The David Ruggles who was an abolitionist and a native of Norwich, a David Ruggles who owned a very vibrant grocery store, a David Ruggles who owned a bookstore that not only sold the latest books and newspapers, but it also sold newspapers with an abolitionist slant. In terms of the Underground Railroad, the Underground Railroad would move Smith from New York into Hartford, and then to Springfield, Massachusetts, where he would spend some time. And where in Massachusetts, he would get an opportunity to study in the ministry. And he would also get an opportunity to begin to lecture about what slavery was really like. And he would get a chance to turn notions that would be said about slavery being benevolent, even in the 19th century on its head, where he would talk about the brutality of the institution that he lived with in the same way that Pennington would talk about the brutality of the institution that he lived with, showing the ties between whether you're in Maryland or Virginia, you're dealing with an institution that has its, its brutal side. But for Norwich, James L. Smith would marry Emmeline and Minerva Platt, Emmeline Minerva Platt in 1842. And he would also raise his family along with his wife in in Norwich. Two daughters would attend uh, Norwich Free Academy and graduate and go on uh, to become teachers in Washington, D.C. He would have a son who would join him in the shoemaker's trade. And there uh, they would build and strengthen their business and their family would become part of a community that had a long history of combating and battling the institution of slavery. Free black communities were key pieces in this struggle 
to end the institution of slavery. And key to that within the black community is the establishment of black churches. Some people simply call them African societies in the early 19th century. But the AME Zion Church is described by the scholars Sierra Lincoln and Lawrence Mamiya. The AME Church is described as the Freedom Church of the 19th century. And all you had to do was look amongst the members of the AME Zion Church to understand that concept. No church was as radical as the AME Zion. No church held as strong a belief in the rights for blacks to be free and independent as the AME Zion Church. Their beginning was established by blacks uh, and they believed that black leadership was best for them in New York and wherever they existed. Now, as far as being part of this tradition, Evans Memorial Zion, Zion Church, AME Zion Church is now part of that tradition. But in terms of the ties that bind, James L. Smith's time on the Underground Railroad is tied to a larger freedom struggle, a larger freedom struggle that depending on which numbers you get, whether it's John Hope Franklin saying that some 100,000 people escaped via the Underground Railroad, or Henry Louis Gates uh, saying that it's maybe 40,000 or 20,000 who escaped through the Underground Railroad. Nevertheless, what the number might be. One of the things that is important about the ties that bind is that it was an unrelenting attack on ending the peculiar institution by enslaved people and by their allies, both black and white. Uh, they were by no means in the North or South, uh, a large number of people. But what you have is a small, concentrated and unrelenting minority of people, both black and white who are part of this Underground Railroad and including James L. Smith and including the people in Norwich, those on Jail Hill, or those on Oak Street who are unrelenting in deciding that this institution had to be overturned. The pinnacle of their radicalism would come from 1861 to 1865. Uh, that's when soldiers in blue from the North, both black and white, decided that they would be the arm that would end slavery. They had their marching orders, but it would be those individuals, those privates and sergeants under the direction of their generals, they were the ones who became further abolitionists for the cause. Now, Reconstruction's passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments were also further radicalisms that happened. But these were radicalisms that also came because of people like Smith, because of people like Pennington. Because if you look into the ranks of the individuals who are, who are runaways, it will be them or their descendants who are there arguing for greater freedom in reconstruction governments in the South. And it will also be these individuals who have the talent to also make the appeal and the call for greater freedom. They understood that their saving grace, James L. Smith understood that his saving grace and for the people at AME Zion in Norwich would always be the ties that bound them to the people in New Haven, the ties that bound them to the free black communities in Hartford, because they were the safe haven, along with their white allies, for changing America. Uh, they were, as I said once before, they were not a huge number of people, but they were simply the right number of people. The right number of people who understood just how the ties bound them together and bound their freedom and how it tied to the North as well as the South. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Close. What right. a wonderful thank presentation. You. I appreciate it so much, thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? 
You're welcome to unmute yourself or you're welcome to pop a question in the chat, whatever is most convenient for you. I have a question for Dr. Close. Um, I'm Christine Jones and um, Dr. Close, I was wondering what, what um, encouraged you to move north yourself? Um, actually, I, I first moved to um, Ohio uh, for graduate school. Um, but in terms of why I moved to um, Connecticut, uh, I was looking for a job and I actually, um, I fell in love with Eastern Connecticut uh, because I, um, I grew up in rural Georgia. And when I moved out to um, Eastern Connecticut to a, um, a little place called Wyndham Center, uh, it was so rural, it was kind of like where I grew up uh, because the deer and the foxes and uh, other animals and turkeys were always uh, coming down the road and in my yard. And then I discovered that I could fish um, on Saturdays and catch a lot of fish. Um, and so I, I love that. And what really hooked me was driving. Um, I um, I was trying to decide whether or not to go up to Maine or whether or not to go to Atlanta, but Atlanta had these like 14 lane highways that just shocked me. And I was like, I can't drive here. Um, and I came to Connecticut and I felt really welcome in Eastern Connecticut. And the, um, I liked the, uh, the quietness of, of Eastern Connecticut. And I really, um, I grew to, um, uh, just adore the uh, the students um, that that I have uh, because they have been just fantastic. And then the um, I got a chance to um, teach the courses that I liked, and I got a chance to do research. And right now I'm heavily engrossed in research on black migration between 1915 and 1917 from the South to Connecticut. And it gives me a, a connection north and south. I'm sorry, that's a long answer, but I, I have like three hour classes and I talk a lot. Great, great answer. Thank you so much for all that you shared. I think I see Faye, is that your hand raised for a question next for you, Faye? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, Go ahead. I was I was so fascinated to see the um, to see the slide and to hear um, about De Deacon James Mars, and I was surprised you didn't mention his autobiography, this the autobiography uh, called Bought and Sold in Connecticut, yes. which Absolutely. just rang so. Uh, I think it ought to be required reading for students in Connecticut because he's his introduction where he says. And this is written during the Civil War. He mm -hmm. said that everyone says to me, "Oh, but we didn't. We never had slavery like that in Connecticut." And he said, "I would tell them I was born and sold a slave in Connecticut, and they would not believe me." And I think that what held true in 1860 holds true today. Every mm -hmm. for year, I'm sure you find it uh, that that people don't believe how long slavery lingered in Connecticut. People people don't believe how long slavery lingered in Connecticut, and surprisingly, when I tell people that Connecticut has farms, people are just flabbergasted. They say, "Why are there farms in Connecticut?" I say, "They've always been farms in Connecticut." <laughs> you know, slavery has existed in Connecticut, and it's just something that it's hard for people outside of Connecticut to really grasp. And I do use um, Mars's uh, work. I teach a course called Civil War Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And so Mars is introduced into my course. Um, and particularly because what he says about being enslaved, but also what he says about uh, the, um, the woman Nancy who was brought by her owner to Hartford yeah. um, and how she should be free and that the notion that you can bring someone who is enslaved to an area that has begun to outlaw slavery is wrong. And he almost paid a very high price for yeah. making that stand. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Faye. Any further questions for Dr. Close? 
If you think of a question after the presentation's over, feel free to email us um, at info at norwichhistoricalsociety.org. I'll put the email in the chat and um, Dr. Close is always happy to speak with people um, afterwards if you have a burning question that you think of right after the program. <laughs> So I just put the email in the chat if anyone has any further questions. Um, a couple of things I just wanna mention before we wrap up. Um, I wanna first thank everybody for coming this evening. We really appreciate you all being here. And of course, a special thank you to our speaker, Dr. Close. Thank you for such a fabulous presentation. I, I learned so much and I appreciate you being here so much as I think we all do. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that I'm gonna put um, some upcoming events in the chat. So if you liked what you saw tonight, we've got some other events coming up um, next month in April. Um, myself and Sheila Hayes are giving a walking tour of the Jail Hill Historic District, the North Freedom Trail tour. So that's coming up in April. And we are also going to be hosting a trivia fundraiser in May as well. More details will be announced uh, regarding that program. It's a partnership with the Norwich Art Center and Norwich Historical Society. So we'll have more details on that coming up. And I also wanna put in the chat really quickly, um, just some information about um, James L. Smith and specifically the uh, new lesson plan that we just created for Norwich's eighth grade students. And also um, in addition to the lesson plan is the video that we have just recently created on James L. Smith's life. So for those who wanna learn more about Smith and Norwich, um, please feel free to check that out. Any last minute questions before we close out the evening, anybody? Last chance? <laughs> if not. Oh, so the question is, is the program about Jail, Jail Hill going to be in-person or virtual? That's a great question. We will be actually hosting an in-person walking tour um, which will be great to get back in, in the field and do um, in-person tours again. So it will be in-person. However, if you're interested in seeing um, it virtually, we do have it filmed from past year and the year before <laughs> available on our YouTube channel. So this year will be in-person, but we do have the virtual tours from last year as well available. And those are all on our website. So thank you all so much. I appreciate you all being here. And again, special thank you to Dr. Close. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and um, thank you so much. Hope to see you all at the next program. Thank you. Okay. Bye Regan, thank you so much. That was amazing.